what an honor to be the first lady on the stage today. Uh, I am so excited to share the stage with such radical world changers and also to be invited because I'm a newbie to Omaha by way of DC just two years ago. And so to stand on the stage and do TEDx Omaha, that's just amazing to me. So in the next 16 minutes, I'm going to share with you what I consider to be a recipe for health equity in the 21st century. And I hope you're really hungry today and you're really excited to learn how we can cook up some equity, not only here in Omaha, but across our nation and possibly the world. So when we think about the TEDx theme this year, it's momentum. And for the past few weeks, I've tried to find the definition that really moved me. And I couldn't find one, so I created my own. And I define momentum personally as those monumental moments that move you forward towards massive action. And I tell people here in Nebraska that I'm a medical doctor by training. I'm a public health practitioner by passion. And my profession is that I'm the deputy director of the Center for Reducing Health Disparities at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and an assistant professor in the College of Public Health. So that's a mouthful. But I haven't always been those things. And it's taken momentum and other things, those monumental moments that have really propelled me forward to be able to stand before you today to deliver this TEDx talk. And so this little girl here with the cute shoes that match the hat, that's me about three decades ago. And that little girl was born premature in the inner city of Detroit to a single mom. And statistically, that little girl that's now a grown woman should not be standing in front of you, but I am. And so again, it's those monumental moments that have made the difference as to why I'm here, and I hope to be able to share with you and tie that all into this idea of creating a recipe for health equity. As I share with you these moments and my life story, I wanna start with the very first monumental moment that happened. I was 13 years old, and I had an opportunity to leave Detroit, Michigan, to go to Piney Woods, Mississippi. So I was living in this urban area, and I moved to this small rural town for high school. And while I was at Piney Woods, it was the first time in my life that anyone ever asked me, not, are you going to college, but where are you going to college? And to be honest, I had never thought about that before, because my plan was to do hair and nails or work at the Cracker Barrel, because I just thought they had the best pancakes in town. But by the time I graduated from Piney Woods, I had an answer. I knew that I was going to the University of Minnesota on a full academic scholarship, but I also knew that I wanted to be Dr. Renesa Anthony, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. And so I went from Mississippi to Minnesota at the University of Minnesota, and I spent the next four years learning about animal husbandry, and I took my first international trip to Korea. And that showed me like there's so much more even behind beyond the United States that I didn't know and that I would have never dreamed of experiencing. And so I graduated in four years and the money ran out for my scholarship and I realized I had no money to go to vet school. And so like any responsible young adult, I went and I got a job and I moved from Minnesota to Indiana. And I worked for Dow AgroSciences as a research biologist. Now, being in Indiana, I was very close to my hometown in Detroit, and I would spend the weekends going home. And now that I had been to urban areas, rural areas, international places, I saw my hometown differently. Not that it was different, but I saw it differently because I had been exposed to so many different things. You know, we say in Rome, we will do as the Romans do, and my Romes kept changing. I went from wanting to do hair and nails to being a veterinarian to I don't know what I'm going to do because I have no money to do what my passion is. And so when I went home, I noticed things like, why is it when I go to my grocery store, I can't find fresh produce? And when I do, it's expensive. And why is it that my closest girlfriends from middle school, they all are talking about the struggles they're having just feeding their children? Because by the time I was 21, most of my friends didn't have just one but two babies. Why was it that some of the kids that I went to elementary school with, they were now infected with HIV AIDS? Or 
um, some of our family friends and my grandmother would call me and say, you know, oh, such and such is gone on the glory. That's what we say when people die. And they lived such a long life. And I'm thinking, well, Mr. Johnson was only 55 or 60, and that's not a long life. And so every time I came home, there were things that I noticed that were different, like where I lived in Indiana, I would come home from work and people would be running and jogging down the street. Yet in my community in Detroit, people weren't running down the streets because of violence. And if you did, they were being chased by the police or there were little kids chasing the ice cream truck. So I started to ask these questions of why. Why are there these differences? Why on my corner store are they advertising tobacco and alcohol? And if I just stand here and listen to some of the conversations and what people are buying, it's radically different than where I live now. And why is it that I see this, but the people who I grew up with don't see it, and now I'm a little weird, and I'm a little different, and I've moved on. And I'll tell you, my grandfather used to say, every time you get a degree, you come home and you stop eating something. <laughs> so I'm his grandbaby that stopped eating pork, and then I stopped eating beef, and then I didn't drink whole milk. But these were things that are in my community that, as I moved around, I learned weren't necessarily healthy for me. And so I had this monumental moment where I said, come on, you want to be a veterinarian and we don't even take our animals to the vet in this community. You are called to do something different. And maybe instead of being Dr. Anthony, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, all these things that you're observing, these problems, you've been called maybe to be Dr. Anthony, MD. And so I went to Chicago, to the University of Chicago, um, for medical school. And I sat in the front few rows most days, and I learned every day how African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans have adverse outcomes, adverse health, highest rates of XYZ, you name it, diabetes, coronary artery disease, we had it. And so I started again to ask, why? And I saw graphs like these where, based on your gender and based on your race, we could predict how long you would live in this country. Now, if you didn't happen to notice, I'm female, the very first one here today, and I happen to also be African American, and for me, this graph was problematic because I didn't get to choose those things, but I knew that every day I was learning that I was at a higher risk of everything you can name. So I even thought on dermatology day, I know we got it, I'm gonna sit in the front row because we don't get skin cancer, and then I learned not only do we get skin cancer, we get one of the most aggressive forms of skin cancer, and I'm going to use the medical term, acrolatinginous melanoma. I said, wow, can't even get derm day. So I went to my third and fourth years, which are your clinical years, and I saw that these things are true. The patients that I see on dialysis look like me, yet the patients who are getting the renal transplants don't. The patients who I see on my ob rotations who have invasive cervical cancer are women of color and women who had low resources who weren't able to get pap test and now they have a disease and a cancer that is preventable or early detected here in the United States. And I kept asking that question of why, 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 and that next monumental moment happened where my attendings and my mentor said, you know, I really think you're interested also in public health. Now, the problem was I had never heard of public health. I didn't know what it was. And I said, well, what is public health? And they said, I don't know. I just know people like you who care about communities. And you could care less on rounds about how to diagnose this. You're asking those really hard questions. And I think public health is right for you. So I left Chicago and went to Boston. That little girl from Detroit was now at Harvard University learning the pillars of public health, which are health promotion and disease prevention. And when I was at Harvard, I had a couple of monumental moments. Number one, I learned about research. And not that basic science in a petri lab kind, a petri dish lab kind, but research where you can ask a question and use the scientific method to answer it. Like, why is it that certain groups of women have higher rates of preterm birth than others? And how do you design a study to answer that? Number two, I learned how to translate my passion into action. And number three, I realized that what I was most passionate about was taking care of women across their lifespan. And so for me, it was only one specialty that was going to work, and that was going to be obstetrics and gynecology. And so I finished my public health degree, went back to Chicago, finished medical school, and matched for ob in Nashville, Tennessee at Vanderbilt University. And when I was there, 
I got to deliver these cuties. And I'm sure that these little cuties could be your baby or your grandbaby or your neighbor or somebody in church, and they are really cute until you attend a funeral of a baby who did not even blow out their first birthday candle. Or until you deliver a 17-weeker and you watch that baby hold on to its last breaths because it's not viable outside of the uterus and it dies. And that for me was a problem because now I knew based on the gender and the race of the babies that I was delivering that I could predict how long they would live, which ones were most likely to have asthma, which ones were most likely to never even go to college. And I started to switch from the whys to the what. And that what was, what can I do? And what can I do to be a part of the solution? Now, I've traveled all over the world, and I've attended some of the best institutions in the United States. And I've been trained specifically in medicine. Yet, the one statistic that bothers me the most is that with all that education and all that exposure, my risk when I choose to be a mother of having a baby that's born preterm like I was, or a baby that never blows out his or her first birthday candle exceeds that of a Caucasian woman who never graduated from high school. And that's a problem. And instead of just stating the problem again, I wanted to know what can we and what can I do about it. And so I knew I had this piece called medicine and I had this piece of public health, but what I didn't have was that missing piece of policy. Because you see, some of the things I saw when I was at Vanderbilt, these policies that were being made by hospital administrators were impacting the doctors, and we had no say. And I learned that those decisions are made at a federal level, and then they trickle down to the state level, to the local level, to our hospitals, and we're just following what we were told to do. And so all roads pointed north for me to Washington, D.C., and I moved there to be a fellow for AAAS working at the National Institutes of Health in the Surgeon General's office. And my number one responsibility at the Surgeon General's office was addressing preterm birth. So I helped convene the Surgeon General's conference on the prevention of preterm birth, and we had two outcomes. Number one, it was we have to address and reduce health disparities. And number two, it was we have to focus on prevention. Now that for me was powerful because in the clinic, when patients came to me, they were already sick. But the work I was doing now, those policies were impacting every single woman, including the ones in this room today. And so when I finished my fellowship, I had an opportunity for my very first real job at George Washington University. And I did research and I taught students and I learned from students and I loved it. But the thing that I loved most about my time at GW was the work that I did on the Affordable Care Act. You see, I had the opportunity to testify before Congress and take not only my stories from my family and my community, but the stories of my patients, the stories of my students to Capitol Hill because we had one goal. Women and children were not going to be left off of the political agenda. And so I was in the gallery the night we got those votes to pass the Affordable Care Act. And I was eight feet away from Nancy Pelosi when she announced to the world that the ACA had been passed. Now, I agree, it's not a perfect bill, but when it comes to mothers and children, the language in that bill is in the right direction, and I'm so proud to have been a part of that work. But I go back to that why, why, and why, and, you know, we have some of the answers, and that answer is really about environment. And there are things in our social environments that dictate our long-term health outcomes. Now see, like I told you, I, I had no control over that I'm female and I'm African American here, but the reality is that my race and ethnicity can only account for a small proportion of any health outcome I ever have, and the reality is that my culture and all these other things here make a huge difference for everyone living and what your health outcomes are. And it has a lot to do with stress. <laughs> so I'm gonna take you back in these final three minutes to this idea of a recipe, and um, I shared with you some of those ingredients that I've collected over the years that I think are really important for health equity. And I have a confession because um, all those years I lived in dorms and I've traveled, uh, I, I, I don't know how to cook. And I know to make a delectable dish that's bold and flavorful, you need quality, fresh ingredients. And so I feel like I have those ingredients right now at the table 
and I have them here. I just don't know what to do with them. I, I need some additional cooks in the room because I don't know if it needs to simmer or if it needs to, to boil or what to put in first or what to put in second, but I know that the key ingredients are here, and my hope is right now I feel so early in my career that 30, 35 years from now when I retire, if I'm ever invited to do something like this, I can really tell you not just the ingredients for health equity, but what you need to do to achieve it. So my recipe for health equity, I've kind of shared with you in the past few minutes, and I'm going to take you back to this one. And I want to focus on that big C, that collaboration, because it cannot be done alone. And so when I got that call to come to Nebraska, to UNMC, I'll be honest, at first I thought, um, I have no intentions of moving to Nebraska. But I came, and I was so impressed by the work that Douglas County and people in Omaha were doing for women and children, whether it was infant mortality or preterm birth, and I wanted to be a part of that work. And so I took the challenge to come here to work with key stakeholders to make a difference in the lives of women and children. So I'm going to take you back to this momentum piece and those monumental moments that move you forward, and I've shared with you some of those. Remember that little girl? That little girl's this grown woman standing before you, and statistically, like I said, I shouldn't be here. But I am, which tells me that data and statistics can be altered and changed because they're just snapshots. But collectively, we can improve, at least here in Omaha. My recipe was research, E for education, C for collaboration, I for initiative and implementation, P for public health and policy, and the E was the empathy to empower. I'm going to leave you with this last one, this last slide here, and that's me with the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Regina Benjamin. And Dr. Regina Benjamin endorses Healthy People 2020 goals, which state that we will eliminate health disparities, we will achieve health equity, and we will improve the health of all people. And so as a professor, I'm going to ask you to do one assignment. When you leave here today, I want you to have one thing that you can do to help us reduce health disparities so we can achieve the ultimate goal. And that ultimate goal is health equity. The idea and a basic principle that all people, regardless of their race and ethnicity, age, gender, religion, whether they came from Detroit, Mississippi, Minnesota, Indiana, Chicago, Boston, Nashville, Tennessee, Washington, D.C., or right here in Omaha, Nebraska, have the equal opportunity to lead healthy, and I'm going to add, quality lives. Thank you.